Coming up today, the market's reaction to Nvidia's earnings. Bitcoin continues to rally higher. Dr. Doom bets against Trump. The Fed turning more hawkish. Target gets bushwhacked. And are we currently witnessing the biggest pump of our lifetimes? You don't want to miss this one, guys. Let's go. And welcome back to the Daily Market Review, everybody. On yet another busy day across financial markets, we're just getting NVIDIA's earnings and all the latest details as I speak. The market given a bit of an underwhelming reaction, even though they came in with really good numbers once again. We're currently off about 2% after hours as I speak. And stick with me today because I'll come back later on and check how it's trading in the post market to give us an idea where it's going to open up tomorrow morning. But first, just to get you informed on all the numbers, revenue continuing to surge at NVIDIA, rising 94% on an annual basis. Simply incredible. What this man's been able to pull off in my 20 plus years of trading and investing, I've never quite seen anything like it. One of the biggest stocks in the world, printing these growth rates and operating margins. Simply amazing stuff. Revenue for the third quarter coming in at 35 billion. Billion, bit ahead of estimates, 33.1. Earnings per share, 81 cents versus 75 cents expected. Net income during the quarter rose to 19.3 billion. That's up from 9.2 billion, same period a year ago. Many of NVIDIA's end customers, Microsoft, Oracle, OpenAI, have started receiving the company's next generation AI chip called Blackwell. Shipments of NVIDIA's Blackwell chips are scheduled to begin in the current quarter and will ramp up next year. Even its current generation AI chip, the H200, grew significantly in the quarter. And just like I was saying yesterday, they came out and confirmed it today. Demand for Blackwell is expected to exceed supply for several quarters in fiscal 2026. So looking out at least another year, like I said, they don't have a demand problem, they have a supply problem. Whatever they make, they can sell and pretty much at whatever price they want as well. And once again, the driving category for NVIDIA is their data center. That's where they record all the sales of their chips and networking equipment as well, more than doubling year over year, up 112%, simply incredible numbers. With Jensen Huang saying, the age of AI is in full steam, propelling a global shift to NVIDIA computing and there's a look at its incredible revenue growth quarter by quarter going back to q3 2021 data center in the green there company originally started a bit over 25 years ago focused on the gaming market, but has since become the leader and the kind of picks and shovels provider for the AI boom. And again, just look at their numbers. Gross margin, 75%, operating 62, net profit margin, 55%. For a company this size, that just shows how dominant and almost monopolistic they are on selling advanced AI chips. Good to see their automotive division growing 30% quarter over quarter as well, although still tiny relative to their data center revenue. And there's a look at the AI data center value chain. Welcome to pause your video player, take a closer look inside the server rack, Chip design and IP, ARM, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel. And just looking at packaging and manufacturing, well, I continue to believe TSMC is kind of the foundation for the whole industry when it comes to advanced AI chips. Without TSMC, NVIDIA is pretty much useless. Well, I continue to believe they're a really important part of the entire supply chain and they could very well become top five global company in the coming years. Also very important, ASML, when it comes to manufacturing equipment and Intel's in there as well, trying to make a comeback, which they very well could over the next couple of years, thanks to a strong drive. To reshore production of chips back in America, Intel's gonna play a role in that, just like TSMC is building out manufacturing plants in Arizona. So we'll still wait to hear all the details from the earnings call. They may have just given indication of a touch softer guidance for Q1. However, what I've seen so far, everything looks pretty good. Got the top and bottom line beat, and like they said, demand for their new Blackwell chip is exceeding supplies looking out to 2026. So we're currently trading around $143 a share, about seven points off all-time highs, 150. And we'll see how it tracks as we get more details coming through. However, at this point of time, market looks to be a little soft, a little bit undecided. Option deals were pricing in an expected 8% move up or down, which we may indeed get tomorrow after the dust settles from post-market and pre-market trading. And before I get into Bitcoin and what's possibly the greatest pump of our lifetimes, just a quick reminder, tomorrow, I'm opening the doors to my new swing trading alert service. Really excited to kick things off. So make sure you come back to the channel tomorrow for more details on this if you're interested in joining. Otherwise, let's just revert back to one of the biggest stories in finance at this point in time, and that's Bitcoin. Continuing its unrelenting march higher, looking like we may hit 100,000 in the coming days, actually, the way this thing is trading. And what's doing even better than Bitcoin is the company that's gone all in on it, MicroStrategy. Up another 10% today with a market cap around 100 billion, even though it only holds about 31 billion in Bitcoin, it's underlying Bitcoin business, doesn't even do half a billion a year in revenue, actually loses money. They've got 4 billion in debt. And just looking at a five minute chart, we're up almost 20%. Going into the close, then we got a few heavy red candles into the close there. Maybe a bit of profit taking, not sure too many traders or funds out there 
have the courage to short this. It's like stepping in front of a steam train. And this could very well turn out to be one of the biggest pumps in our lifetimes. MicroStrategy now top 100 company in America as measured by market cap, making CEO Michael Saylor's 1990s pump back in the tech bubble, which was previously one of the biggest pumps of all time, making that look like practice for this one. And there's the front cover of the Daily News newspaper out of New York back in March 2000. Lost six billion in a day. Hotshot tech CEO loses fortune as his company's stock plunges 140 points. MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor. And that was the day the market figured out he was running a fraud. Cooking the books, recording revenue he had not received and would not receive, end up getting charged by the SEC for which he settled with. And there's a look at his pump from back in 99. Stock went up from under $10 a share at the start of the year. Come March 2000, $330 a share. Over 30x gain. However, it didn't take the market long to figure out he was a fraud. In just a few short months, it fell over 95% and actually continued to go lower in the following years. So he looks to have learned a lot from from his first pump back then, back at it again with an even greater pump. He's offloaded almost 70 million shares of MicroStrategy onto the market this year, with most likely a lot of retail traders buying those shares off him as his full-time job is to go around on media and shows all day, pumping up the price of Bitcoin along with his stock. And once again, it's working for him very well. As his net worth just soared above 10 billion, thanks to an army of believers who believe in his vision, corner the Bitcoin market, mostly for the benefit of a handful of whales. Remember, over 90% of Bitcoin is owned by less than 2% of all Bitcoin wallets out there. And he thinks it could reach 13 million by 2045, which would no doubt make him the richest man in the world. And so has he cracked the infinite money loop, figured out the secret to unlimited riches, not by creating an innovative product or service, but by cornering a digitally finite market in which it's easy for anyone around the world with a click of a button to pile on top of him. And he just posted today on X, given the high demand, we upsized our micro strategy offering of 0% convertible bonds due 2029 from 1.75 billion to 2.6 billion, including a 400 million green shoe option, priced at a 55% conversion premium. And for those of you who don't know, convertible bonds are just like normal bonds. You lend money, a company has got a fixed term for when they will pay you back. Your principal typically comes with a coupon, yearly interest payments, which you typically get something. However, MicroStrategy doesn't even need to offer a coupon payment. They give no coupon payments. And convertible bonds are just that. They can be converted into shares at a certain ratio, for which he's already saying there's a 55% premium. So bondholders can sell their bonds and get shares shares, gives them a potential way to participate in the upside while protecting themselves from the downside. If the stock goes down, they don't have to convert. However, they don't earn any interest. And just like normal bonds, you short inflation. So if we get a lot of inflation between now and then, purchasing power of your principal's gone down. And just like normal bondholders, you wear credit risk. If micro strategy goes under, so could your bonds. And so this is what he does. And he plans to do $40 billion of this over the coming five years. And why the market's so excited, people jumping over each other to buy micro strategy shares. And it's kind of the same as paying over three dollars for every dollar of bitcoin they hold simply because the market is super excited about this infinite money loop that michael sale has figured out markets pricing in this can go on for a lot longer and not to mention all the momentum feeding on itself now but in my opinion just like back in 2000 it'll inevitably crash no one knows when or how but if it doesn't it'll be the first time in finance someone's pulled off something like this if let's say after five ten years micro strategy still has a greater market cap than what it does today however if you study finance what he's actually doing is completely opposite of creating value for shareholders in the long run. Just like these big tech companies have bought back shares and decreased the amount of shares outstanding, decreased the supply of shares, squeezes the stock price higher, Michael Saylor is doing the absolute opposite. These convertible bonds are increasing the amount of shares outstanding. In fact, over doubling just in the last two and a half years. That's very dilutive for shareholders in the long run and is actually negative shareholder yield. Ideally, you want to invest in companies that are buying back their shares instead of issuing more and more and more because he could end up facing gambler's ruin because the average cost of his Bitcoin is going higher and higher. If Bitcoin makes a big pullback or correction, or instead I should say, when it makes a big pullback and correction, his house of cards may come crumbling down just like it did back in 2000. But the thing is, he's got so many people on board with him buying into his infinite money loop. Even the classic doomsayer, Robert Kiyosaki, the guy who wrote the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he believes sale is right that Bitcoin's going to 13 million. He is one smart boy. And he's saying for $9,000 today, you can buy 0.01 Bitcoin and you'll be a millionaire tomorrow. Sure beats going $50,000 in debt for a student loan, studying for years. Get smarter, buy Bitcoin today, I am. And just like Heisenberg said on X today, why are more companies not doing what MicroStrategy is doing? So what happens if all the biggest companies in the world started doing this, just issuing convertible bonds, piling into Bitcoin? And of course, Peter Schiff is biased.
less being a gold bull, but I agree with them. The more people that pile onto this, it just means fewer resources will be available to devote to stuff we actually need. And it's no doubt gonna slow innovation. And what's it doing for kids and business school students? We got this post today. A kid makes a coin and dumps on people for 30,000 while live streaming because kids are looking up to people like Michael Saylor and Bitcoin. And instead of starting business or working on an innovative product or service, he's running his own pump, just like his hero is. Creating a little meme coin, pumping it up online, and then dumping to his audience, in which he just cut the live streaming off after he made all their profit. Which is pretty much exactly what Michael Saylor is doing, just on a larger scale. And like I said, it is working for him. But what's really lit it up is obviously the election result. Getting a really pro-crypto government takes it to a whole new level. And like I said before the election, there's just nothing stopping it now. The new admin considering a crypto lawyer to lead the SEC, kicking out crypto hawk Gary Gensler, and once again, stacking the admin with another crypto bull. And so there's just no telling how high Bitcoin could go. It's an unproductive asset. No one's using it to transact or go and buy their bread and milk. Nor does it yield anything. Nor does it have industrial uses or can be worn as jewelry like traditional precious metals. It's just so easy to buy digitally online. And that's why I continue to believe could very well be the number one pump of all time. And like I always say, that's not to take away from blockchain technology. There's obviously a lot of good things there. I'm just talking about the valuation of Bitcoin and MicroStrategy's infinite money loop of issuing convertible bonds into shares and then plowing all that 0% interest financing into Bitcoin. And because of Michael Saylor's character, he will continue doing this until he's a trillionaire if he can. Because in my opinion, people don't change. Once a fraud, always a fraud. He's just figured out a better mousetrap this time. But he's not the only beneficiary of a pro-crypto admin. Others out there as well. Coinbase having a good rip since the election, along with crypto broker Robinhood. Also big volumes and gap up after the election. It's up almost 20%, 6th of November. And it's interesting because the months leading up to the election, media wasn't talking a whole lot about gold, the US dollar. How I've noticed they're starting to a lot more now. Article out today, gold will sort of record highs in the first year of Trump's term as uncertainty sparks a flight to safety. And this to me is a little bit of a contrarian signal, especially when you see in the media that something will definitely happen. Wager a bet most of the time it doesn't. When headlines are so certain of something, but that's not to take away from the bull market in gold which is obviously still well and truly intact. Like I said of late, what has actually been trading off is geopolitics. Because look at that monster move for gold down over 3%, which is a huge move for gold the day after the election. Is that the market pricing in more inflation? Or is that the market pricing in less chance of global wars? Because we've seen an escalation from the outgoing administration this last couple of days, along with a bump up back in gold, which is pretty obvious to me what it's trading off at this point in time. But it's funny to see an economist, the one known as Dr. Doom. And like many in the finance community, he's called 20 of the last two recessions. He launched the Atlas America Fund, ETFs marketed as a hedge against incoming risks. The fund will invest in inflation-protected treasuries and gold, among other assets. He expects heightened volatility in the coming years, and that protectionist trade policies could upend the market and he's positioning a fund as kind of an insurance policy on all his predictions. Not cheap either. 75 basis points is up there for an ETF. So I'll keep a track of this fund over the coming years and we'll see whether Dr. Doom is right. I agree with the narrative of this article. It's more of a stock picker's paradise. Because of this new administration, just looking back at his last term, the performance between the S&P's 11 sectors was remarkably uneven. So a lot of dispersion between the sectors and what they call a stock picker's market. Because you've got a lot of stocks going up, you've got some going down, you've got some going sideways. It's not just one big school of fish, but rather there's pockets of outperforming and underperforming sectors, which we've already seen actually since the election. And there's a look at sector performance. Since the market got news of the election and how things have moved since market opened 6th of November, interesting to see energy make a bit of a comeback, now leading the pack since then, along with financials, consumer discretionary, communications, small caps, and utilities, doing the weakest, healthcare, materials, staples, and REITs. But look at that huge dispersion since the election. Best sector up over 7%, the worst sector down over 3%. And that's a good environment for stock pickers because it allows you to outperform the market, of course, if you're invested in the winning sectors. However, I also agree with the narrative of this article, the risk of conflict between the new president and the Fed is very high. Could be a bit of a showdown. Powell and Trump aren't exactly besties. New president would very much like to replace him, but Powell said he ain't leaving. And according to law, he doesn't have to either. He wants to see out his full term, which I think takes him to mid-26. But more and more Fed members are changing their tune, getting more hawkish. We just heard that again today from Fed Board Governor Michelle Bowman, in which she said, progress in lowering inflation appears to have stalled. Just so happened a week after the election, after they were super dovish right before it. And interest rate traders as well. I'm not too sure whether Jay Powell will cut next month or not. Almost at 50-50 here. 
and the two-year yield is trading firm as well. 431 hasn't given us much of a pullback for a few months now. So the terminal rate for the Fed, where they finished easing, may be a lot higher than what the market thought just a few months ago. It may indeed only have a cut or two left in them. And the market's pricing of inflation expectations is indeed still firm. We very well could see a bump back up inflation. That isn't just caused overnight by new tariffs either, but rather what's happened over the last four years, over a quarter of all USDs been created, Fed more than doubling their balance sheet, printing $5 trillion in new money. All that may have not completely washed out of the system, along with animal spirits from stock and crypto markets, and indeed tariffs could very well be inflationary, at least while the economy and market digests it. And one sector of the market that has been hit hard ever since the election, drug makers, along with packaged goods and sugary snacks. And the market may have indeed overreacted to this. I don't think the need for these drugs in addressing obesity is going to magically disappear. What RFK is going to do, if he's even successful, could take years. And I think he's trying to enact more of a cultural change and approach to healthcare and food. But it's true, some of these leading GLP-1 drug makers may have set up for a bit of a contrarian play, or at least a swing trade here, to get a bit of a bounce there today And Eli Lilly. After it came off pretty hard after the election, others as well, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer trying to find support down here, and getting a little bit of a bounce today in the snack makers. PepsiCo sitting at a key support zone here, looking back to October last year, quite technically oversold in the short term and a few others, ConAgra Brands and Kraft Heinz, trying to find a bit of a bottom here so they could potentially be setting up for a bit of a bounce back. But like I said, there's a lot of dispersion in this market. We've got some stocks absolutely melting up and others pulling back. It's good for stock pickers, also good for swing traders. I'm seeing a lot of great swing trading setups out there, which is why I'm really excited to start my new swing trading alert service. I'll be sending out the first alert this Sunday night to start trading next week. And just like my stock pick service, I've created a brand new trading account for my Swing Alert service. And I've already deposited 30,000 US dollars into it. And anybody who joins my Swing Alert service, you'll be able to follow this account going forward. And like I said, I send out all my alerts at 9.30 p.m. New York time, the night before they're to be traded in the market. And so I'll be trading all my alerts that I send out the next day on my own account. And everything's 100% transparent. You'll see everything in the private members area along with screenshots from all my trade fills so you can see exactly what I'm doing and how my account is performing. I'll be sharing all the ups and downs of my new swing trading account as my goal is to take it to $1 million in under 10 years, which with monthly contributions, I'll need about an average annual growth rate around 24% to hit. And in comparison to my stock picks account, my target annual return for that was 18% to hit my million dollar challenge, which in just under six months of operating this account, I'm already well ahead of my target for this year. So I'm hoping to actually hit my million dollar goals in under 10 years. But of course, there's likely to be a bear market along the way. Sure, there'll be some other surprises, but I'm gonna trade all the way through it. And like I said, I'll be sharing all the ups and downs with my paid members. So if you haven't already, subscribe to this YouTube channel or head on over to my website, clickcapital.io, navigate to the daily market review page and then scroll down and join my private email list. And I'll notify you as soon as the doors open to my swing trading alert service tomorrow, along with the coupon code so you can save 33% off. And that's a permanent discount with no lock-ins, cancel anytime. And each night after market close, I'll send you what alerts I'm gonna trade in my swing trading account in the next day. So make sure you stay on the lookout for that tomorrow. And I'm super excited to start growing this swing trading account starting next week. Okay, just getting back in the daily market review, we've got another billionaire investor, this time Howard Marks, snapping up what some call uninvestable Chinese asset. That's his hedge fund Oak Tree buying Chinese assets. It says are unfairly depressed, thinks the country has great potential as it tries to balance out its economy, and he thinks there's a lot of bargains to be had there. Joining a few others in the hedge fund community, Ray Dalio, David Tepper, Michael Burry, and a few of us that have been buying the recent dip in Chinese shares as there's a lot of uncertainty and what the tariffs are going to be. Is it going to spill over into a nasty trade war? Or will it be a nothing burger? Probably something in between. And there's a look at FXI. Still floating around here a bit. It's on about a 50% pullback of the initial move up after they came out and announced massive stimulus. I'd say now they're just waiting to see what tariffs they do get hit with, then they'll make their next move. And just after we got a good earnings from Walmart yesterday, Target came out with their earnings today, absolutely shocking the street. Posting earnings, buck 85 a share, well below expectations, 230. Revenue only rising 1%. 1.1%, again, lower than expectations. And they came in for a triple miss. Top bottom line, along with Outlook, which of course the Elgos punished them severely. Also hitting the company, decision to pull forward, reroute shipments in anticipation of East Coast port strikes. So the market could 
also be worried about Chinese tariffs. A lot of their product comes from China, which I think they've got more exposure to than Walmart. They also said the consumer's discretionary demand is a bit soft. And again, that affects Target more than Walmart. Walmart has more staples. Wall Street analysts lowering their expectations. And just look at that monster move for a big blue chip like Target down 22%. Again, so much dispersion in this market, but the wealthy end of town is not hurting. We can see that with high-end retailer of home goods, William Sonoma, coming through with a pretty good beat there today. And the market loving it, up 27%. Once again, the retail sector as a whole, caught in the middle, continuing this month's long consolidation. But just looking at the biggest, Amazon, still holding up well, of course, Walmart, after their really good earnings yesterday as well, actually finished the day higher. Market didn't take note of Target at all there. And just looking at what else is hot in the market, Destiny Tech 100 Fund. This is this closed-end fund that has investments in private unlisted companies, SpaceX being one of them, a few other unicorns like Stripe. Market trading at a huge premium to NAV. Many investors are jumping over each other just to get a piece of this. Also ripping again today, Red Cat Holdings, another small cap software growth stock. Market's been taken a liking to lately. And what's clearly the hottest trade, quantum computing, small cap QUBT, still a market cap less than half a billion, up 44% today on 105 million shares. Similar size company, D-Wave Quantum, up 12%. Look at all that volume over the last couple of weeks. And there's a look at the other hot stocks of late. New scale power, having a little bit of a pullback along with space stocks, catching their breath. Rocket Lab, still trading near highs though. And just getting back to NVIDIA, looking at post-market trading as I speak, still consolidating here, just down 1.5%. Market's given a bit of a muted reaction, a bit underwhelming. Guess we'll have to see how we finish in regular trading tomorrow, whether the market can make its mind up, whether that was a good result and outlook or not. Because currently, we're just trading around here, 143. And the semiconductor sector as a whole, still trading pretty thick and consolidating for a few months. We may not get that clear direction from this NVIDIA result. And just looking at the queues after hours, pretty much trading flat. Did initially sell off, maybe a bit of a buy the dip there. And so once again, another pretty flat day in the market. And that's a wrap for the daily market review today, guys. Thanks very much for tuning in. And like I said, come back to the channel tomorrow. And if you're on my email list, be on the lookout in your inbox for details. This time tomorrow, when my new swing trading alert service opens, and like I said, I'll be offering a 33% discount for launch week only, and that's a permanent discount. And anybody interested in getting my stock pick service as well, I'll also offer a 33% discount on a combo package deal. Otherwise, I'm really excited to start trading this new account. And like I said, I'll share every step of the way, all ups and downs with members, along with a private backend and monthly report. There's plenty of great opportunities in the market. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. And so let's kick things off starting tomorrow. Cheers.